Hello and welcome to the BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. I'm Orlando and we're here today to talk about exciting ingredients, cooking techniques and general kitchen chat. Plus, we have an original Tom Kerridge recipe for you to try out at home, whether you're a beginner or a budding chef. Hi, and welcome to this week's BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. We're going to be talking brownies, how to spot a good one, how to make them, and that very important thing, how to know when they're cooked. Now, I've never met anyone who doesn't like brownies, but I'm going to ask you, Tom, what was your first experience of brownies? Did your mum make them? Yeah, I, my mum made them. I think it's probably the first thing that most mums make, isn't it? It's one of those... Um, it's one of those quite easy to do, whack it together, stick it in a tray, and it doesn't really matter if it's undercooked. It's not like a cake. We're not trying to make a sponge here, are we, that you, you're checking that it's risen properly and it's all equal. And it's a, The beautiful thing about a brownie is it's uneven. It's got a crispy top. It's got a soggy middle. It's kind of like bits around the edge. There's nothing about it that should be even there's nothing there's nothing exact and precise about it being perfect we're not looking for it being this perfect raised cooked confectionery or cake are we we're looking for something that's just a bit more rustic yeah and it's got those corners which are always a bit chewier than the rest aren't yeah, they're they the best bits. well you can yeah i quite like the gungy bit from the middle as well the kind of undercooked bit but yeah. my mum used to make them and they were quite chewy in a good way chewy but and she had nuts in them always but um you're right they were just a co- piece of chocolatey goodness and they were always nice because mum made them weren't they yeah exactly that is a special <laughs> treat that tasted amazing and and is it and he's he's quite easy to make and who doesn't like chocolate yeah I, I quite agree now um we're going to be tasting brownies a bit later which is going to be um, we're all very excited about oh, that what, what a what a painful <laughs> afternoon are you going to take a couple home for your son as a treat for him i may well do you never know it, it depends which one <laughs> <laughs> well there's a competitive element that we will be unleashing in the fullness of time um now what do you think makes a brownie a brownie is it is it just a chocolate nut thing or is it because it's square or what? I think, uh, I mean, there's so many, everyone knows a brownie is being square. I think the shape kind of defines it. I and think I, it needs to have corners somehow. Yeah. I, I have done triangular ones, which are, they work, but round one, it wouldn't, it would be kind of a weird thing. It wouldn't be a brownie, would it? Yeah. It round? Yeah. I think you're right. I don't think you'd say that's a brownie if it's round. You'd call it something else, wouldn't you? I mean, I, but whereas I, I think it's the, the fact that they are square, I think the fact that that it's kind of like undercooked a little, you know, that it's got that lovely gooey middle that makes it a brownie. And I think the nuts are relatively important. I don't. Th- I think you can have brownies without them, but I like br- I like a brownie with nuts in. Yeah, it's it turns it into a little bit more of a, a adventure of in the eating adventure, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, I like things where you start to eat the piece of food and then you carry on and it develops. Something happens Layers. as you get to the end of it, which is why that one bite cookery where you just have everything's miniaturized on the plate doesn't appeal to me. But that's just a, a personal thing. I know that's not what you do in your restaurant anyway, do you? No, but I hundred percent agree. I think everything should be layered and layered and layered. Flavors should come from all different angles and surprise and be beautiful and, and you can get that that's the beautiful thing about a brownie that you can layer it with different things you can put if you wanted to you could put chili in it works really well you could put <laughs> it does chili and chocolate are lush they go so nicely together if you wanted it you could put herbs through it things like mint would be beautiful bay leaf infused in some in the melted butter and take them out or you know those sort of things you can just start thinking of interesting bits you put in it salt we all love salt caramel so there's lots of different things you put through it not just the the standard nuts and chocolate chips and you know marshmallows and all that sort of stuff you can start going actually where else can i get layers of flavor into it and that's what makes it really exciting yes that will kind of extend the interest of the brownie i mean i love brownies but i'm very classic i just make the same one all the time yeah but um, i can see that you're much more experimental than i am and that you you want you want to take it to new places yeah, I think, it, but as a chef, we're quite lucky. You, you work in a professional kitchen, you can have a go at something. It doesn't really matter. You're there all day. You're working in that space and environment. It's whilst we're doing something else. I kind of understand it when you're at home, though. That why why would you necessarily try something new? Because you're having a go at making it once. You, you know, you have a day job. You have something else. You've got things to do in the evening. You're going to make chocolate brownies. 
why are you trying something that might be a little bit scary and fail if you've got friends coming over? I, yeah, I get um, why, why mess get, with a good thing, really. Why mess with a good thing? But so does that mean that in the restaurant, you're always trying stuff out just for the sake of trying out ideas? That, always, always. Is, is everyone things. trying it out or are you kind of masterminding the trying out department? Well, the, the, a lot of it comes from senior chefs that have been with us for a long time. We go, right, how do we move this forward? Where do we go? What flavor profiles can we move towards? How do we drive dishes forward? what's seasonal what's coming in next what flavors are around what do we like how does it sit in balance with the menu there's so many questions to ask but that's good because it means that there's so much development going on all the time and it keeps it interesting and exciting i just thought of flavor licorice licorice would be interesting in brownies, delicious wouldn't it? absolutely you've amazing you've probably tried that you've probably beaten that and come yeah, out but, the other side if i know that you. would be fantastic but you could get that from so many different things you can get that from from, from licorice or licorice infused you can get it from tarragon you can get it from star anise you can get it from fennel you could get it so so you start Im- imagine lovely pieces of candied fennel in it how lovely would that be really nice if these are going to start turning up on your menu, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> now, can we talk chocolate? Yeah. Um, people get obsessed a bit about chocolate and they think that their success of their thing depends on you know exactly which chocolate they bought. Mm. Um, are you a fan of a particular type of chocolate? Or... You mean in brand or, or cocoa solids? Either, really. I was going to say milk or dark chocolate, but um, we can talk... Dark, to, dark, talk dark chocolate, chocolate is always the best for cooking for things like this because it, 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 the higher the fat content, the more chance you have of it splitting out, okay? And quite often milk chocolate, that sometimes that you buy on the high street, is an emulsification of cheaper fats, which means that it's not emulsified very well, so when you heat it up, it splits out at a lower temperature. You don't want that dark chocolate. It's all about having the cocoa mass, the cocoa solids, and about how it, how it actually performs forms well and and the fat content comes from cocoa butter not necessarily from cheaper fats that's why some confectionery that we have on the high street shouldn't even or isn't even allowed to be called chocolate because it's it's an emulsification it's chocolate flavored effectively yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly i mean i take it that we're reaching for 70 percent chocolate or above are we yeah 70 percent or above and Fre- french belgian italian chocolates do, do you dabble with those we yeah i i mean it's it's also very difficult to find great high street chocolate that performs well. But if you're looking for good, just, if you just look for good seventy percent and above um, for dark chocolate, should work really nicely for all of the dishes. And if you find it's not sweet enough, you can always add sweetener to it or more butter or more dairy to whatever it is you're doing. Just don't buy the cheap chocolate in the first, the milk chocolate, the cheap chocolate in the first place to make something like this. You soften it by using, adding extra ingredients, but make sure the chocolate is good. I know that some people find dark chocolate poor things, a little bit kind of headachey. But there's nothing we can do about that because we're looking for an intense chocolate taste, aren't exactly. we? Exactly. It's, it's an intense chocolate flavour. That's what we look. It's the same as people who drink black coffee. And I'm a big black coffee lover. I love the intensity of it. It's, it's about it having strong flavours. Then you can stretch out. Some people would hate an espresso, right? The idea of an espresso is just, well, it's way too big. However, if you mix that through a chocolate mousse and now you've got this lovely kind of mocha taste, you've still got the same strength of chocolate, but it's diversified and and kind of like spilled through a larger kind of mousse flavour, but it gives you the touch and the the flavour there, a hint of coffee. So the same sort of thing you do with dark chocolate, you get big, intense flavours, but you can stretch it and spread it. So a little bit will go a lot further for giving for giving you that big chocolatey taste. Now, I think you were back quite recently from the States. Yes. And of course, a brownie it was invented in the States and came over, I think, in about the 50s or 60s over here. Um, I hope you ate some great brownies out there, but now tell me. I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't eat a single brownie out there. I was trying to be very good. I was out there for about a month. I was out there for about four weeks out of seven. I was backwards and forwards, work commitments here and stuff going on there. And it was, and I tried to stay as healthy as possible, although it wasn't, it wasn't that doable in the <laughs> States, I've got to be honest. But actually, people say that American food is poor. And there's a lot of it that is quite poor. The high street stuff is it's very it, it's not of a great standard but that's not necessary that's the fault it's just the sheer scale of the country you have a central production kitchen here in the uk and it can be wherever it needs to be within three or four hours in the states you can drive for three or four hours and you're still nowhere near the next city you yeah. know it's it's so vast so it struggles from that but i i didn't I didn't have a good brownie, but I tell you, I did have 
I did have a great burger. I did have a really good milkshake and I did have some amazing donuts. So, I mean, there was some brilliant stuff there. I didn't find the great brownie, though. We will definitely be considering those in future podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree with you that, that the largely the problem of American food and the, the reason it's got an unfairly bad reputation is the, the mass manufacturing, which is just yeah. on too big a scale. Because American home cooking is a fantastic tra tradition, rich with all those European strains which were taken out there and loved by people. And they really take care. And if Americans do something with passion, boy, they go insane for it. I mean, their, their sourdough clubs are a, amazingly energetic, frantic. They, yeah. so, they get so keen on anything. And if they do it well, they boy, do they do it beautifully. Yeah, they, they grab hold of something and they go for it great. Uh, I mean, and you're right. I mean, the food there is so influenced by European and, and immigration of how, how great, depending on which area we went to, you could see the food has been inspired by um, um, and influenced by whether it's uh, Eastern European cooking, whether it's, you know, great Polish dishes, great Ukrainian dishes, fantastic food. I mean, I'm talking, I mean, desserts. I went to Florida Keys, it had key lime pie yeah. and I had it cooked in the original kitchen that it was invented in. And do you know what? Those key limes and key lime pie was absolutely stunning. And we're used to this bright green kind of manufactured awful stuff that you can see in like put together and frozen in supermarkets here. However, real key lime pie was delicious. Like it was, it was beautiful. And they're very funny little limes, aren't they? They don't look like, are they kind of oval or something, the limes? What do yeah, they look? Yeah, they, they are. Shape. They're kind of oval and almost, uh, almost yellow in colour. So th th yeah, the key lime, I mean, it is a tiny little lime. It's not, it's not called key lime pie because of, florida keys it's a key it, lime so it's yeah, yeah it's a very different ingredient to a lime that we'd have in this country and if you actually if you mix lime juice from this country lime and lemon that we get and put those two flavors together that's more like what a key lime tastes like oh, it's I slightly see. more acidic and sharper than uh, more on the more on the lemon side than it is the lime side because lime can be very floral in flavor can't exactly, it so it's yeah, yeah but i mean it's the same old thing you're saying about american food is eat local if you get the chance yes. eat, eat the food of the region rather than the, the 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 global type food exactly but that's something like i mean a brownie can transcend everywhere can't it so it's something that's so delicious that it could be you know i, I could have had a brownie in everywhere i went in the states and believe <laughs> me i went north west east and south i was all over the place so i could have had a brownie everywhere but i was just trying to be a good boy <laughs> now you serve brownies in your restaurants do you yeah well we do versions of things like it so you, you, we play on the understanding of soft and squishy and chocolatey and salty and caramelly and nutty and all those sort of things the sort of things that you fall in love with a brownie we then take to the next level we do we do a hand of flowers chocolate cake but it's kind of like a, an ale cake um, sponge that's then wrapped in this kind of like taut mix that has this beautiful texture that's smooth and rich, but it's very similar to the middle of a slightly undercooked and pressed brownie. So that's that's the sort of thing that we do there. Yeah. So we 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 use that brownie influence and and make it into something that we love. What is it about undercooking chocolate that that it works? It, like like slightly undercooked chocolate cake is fabulous isn't it's, it yeah but it's it's something so in, it feels so indulgent it's rich it's gooey it's 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 kind of caramelly it's all of those it's the texture as well that leads it to being feeling that it's i mean it's proper treat stuff it's indulgent and it makes you feel like you're doing something really naughty yes it's kind of soft in the mouth somehow but uh it, it gives its flavour, it releases its flavour in a beautiful way. Chocolate's unlike any other ingredient, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. The flavour profiles and levels on it are so good if you're buying really good chocolate. Still to come on BBC Good Foods podcast with Tom Kerridge. We've got we've got little bits of white chocolate coming in there just just for the for the pleasure of it. Come on, look at that! <laughs> That's not a little bit of white chocolate. There's a massive it, chunk it's of it. A it's a shard, I'd yeah. say, isn't it? <laughs> 
Um, we've had a question from a Twitter following, um, a Twitter follower called Amy Trrr, that's Amy T, uh, sorry, Amy T-R-R-R, and she says, how can you tell when to take brownies out of the oven? We're going to talk a bit mo- more about the recipes in a moment, but that particular thing is worrying Amy Trrr, <laughs> and um, she obviously is aiming for this undercooking that we're talking about, but not quite achieving it so it's kind of it's it's almost like the reverse of a of a sponge cake when you put a knife into a sponge cake and take it out and the knife is nice and clean that means it's ready and it's cooked but if you put your knife into the middle of the brownie and take it out and it's still got like goo all over the knife but it's still just warm and co- it feels warm that's when to take it out because that means that the egg content in it is cooked yeah or cooking just like you do like a scrambled egg or a fried egg it means that it's just set in it's just cooked but it's still not kind of sponged it out it's not solid it's not just gone really hard so that's the point to take it out and you can almost tell by touch if you put your hand on it just gently push into it and it kind of just sinks a little and almost springs back but not much you go right that's ready i can take that out i wonder if amy is actually expecting a bit of a wobble because it shouldn't really wobble no, should it? The, the brownie mixes are normally so dense that they don't wobble and it's not like a lemon tart where you're looking for just set it's you're looking for still gonna be solid you might have to just touch it with your hand and give it a little push in and just if it feels like squishy take it out then that's the best way if a brownie's squishy take it out <laughs> <laughs> that's a, a rule for brownies yeah. for the future. There you go. That's um, how two Michelin star chefs cook brownies. If it feels squishy, that's the, then it's ready. Now, where do you stand on blondies, Tom? Which, uh, well, you know what they are. But yeah. it, it's not really a brownie at all, but it's in the family. I find them personally a little sweet. I find them too far the other side. I find them a little bit... Um, they're more about the sugar content rather than the chocolate content. And chocolate with sugar is, you know, it tastes great. It's lovely. But it, it's a, that's always about the dark chocolate flavour. Blondies, I I like, but they are they are a little bit on the sweet side for me. They've got that slight kind of condensed milk atmosphere to them. I mean, condensed milk can be great in the right circumstances, but they there's something, as you say, just a bit sugary about them without delivering real flavour somehow. Exactly. They're quite sickly. Listen, I, my little man would love it and kids would love them. I mean, they're great. You know, they're, they're big sugar hits and they'd be great at parties. However, for me to have that, I, I wouldn't pick one. If there was one sat next to a brownie, I'd pick the brownie every time. <laughs> How are you on store-bought brownies? Uh, to be honest, I've never bought a shop-bought brownie. It's not been something that I've... It's not the first thing that I go to. If it was a if it was a quick, sweet treat that I was looking for for the family and, and like, or someone was coming around last minute and I was in the shops and someone's there and I got to grab it, I wouldn't go for the brownie. I wouldn't go for a shop-bought one because there's something... I think they're so easy to make. It's something nice about them if they're still just warm once you've cut them and ready to serve there's something very special about home baking i mean we've all seen it over the last few years how how amazing that show has been and how it's got people into the kitchens baking again and people are loving the idea of making cakes and cookies and it shows that it, there's so much about it that about baking like this that isn't about it being exact or it isn't about it getting 100 percent right it's not about mission star cookery it's about the enjoyment of doing it in flavours. And that's where I think home-baked stuff really does excel. And that's where people are enjoying it much more because actually a home-baked cake that's been out of the oven for half an hour that's still got that little bit of lovely warmth on it that feels special that you've made is like a million percent better than anything you buy from the shop, even if something from the shop has, is, is, is sharper-looking, tighter-looking, packaged nicely doing it yourself and eating it yourself. There's something very, very special about that. Yeah, you kind of, you taste the love that's gone into the making of it. I did encounter a cake last Christmas, actually, which was a Christmas cake that was made by... A Christmas cake Christmas, at Christmas? Okay. Who, heard of a, who heard of anything so ridiculous? <laughs> it's a, it's a, a, a husband and wife team who make 
uh, Christmas puddings and Christmas cakes in their farm kitchen. And I believe they've got a couple of children who are being home educated. And when they're not being home educated, they come in and stir things as well. So it's it, the same kind of degree of love and affection was going into these Christmas cakes. And because because Christmas cake needs to stand around and be fed with a bit of brandy and stuff, it's something that's actually benefiting from the time in that case. So can we have that as a kind of honourable exception to the, the bought cake thing? If you, yeah. If you buy it from these lovely people in Devon. Listen, if you've bought it from these lovely people in Devon and you keep feeding it, that's the prob- That's the process. Christmas cakes are slightly different because they're the sort of thing that matures with flavour because what you've got going on there, you've got fruit and all of that kind of fruit is infusing and ageing and tasty and you keep feeding it brandy or whatever it is, you know, and making sure that you're, looked at, you're looking after it. It's, it. That's almost like looking after a great cheese <laughs> in a cave, you know, a cave aged cheese that they're loved and turned every, you know, turned a quarter every week or whatever. It's the same sort of thing. And that love and affection goes into those sort of cakes. Definitely, they're very different. They're exempt from the brownie baking rules. <laughs> We're going to be talking Christmas in another podcast, so let's let's go mad with our feeding at that point. Um, I want to talk about the crust on a brownie because this gets people very excited. And yeah. I was recently somewhere, and someone pulled. Uh, it was a, a sort of a, a restaurant, and someone pulled out a, 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 a tray of brownies, and they had on the top that lovely sugar crust. And I said, "Congratulations! That's what we all want our brownies. That kind of." Almost meringue crust. Do you regard that as uh, the sign of a good brownie yeah. or unnecessary? Or No, I think it's great. I think a crust on a brownie is brilliant. Now, the thing that makes that special and the difference is because they, they can, brownies contain quite a bit of egg and the melted chocolate and the melted butter, and they all start off fairly similar. But when you normally cook things with, with, that, that you're trying to just set, Okay, you normally, particularly with eggs in it, you generally cook them on a lower temperature so that they kind of just, like a lemon tart, you want them, you cook them at around about 140, 150 degrees so they don't souffle up or they don't, they just set. But the thing about a brownie is you normally cook it on a slightly higher temperature, around 180-ish, 190. So that instant, slightly hotter heat comes in and that's the bit that gives it that lovely crust on the top. But you take it out before it's all cooked all the way through. So you get the lovely crust that's cooked on the top, but that's where you get nice and gooey in the middle because you take it out just before it's all the way cooked. But it's just not set, whereas it's a process of a hotter oven as opposed to a gentle kind of uh, standard set, consistent warm heat. So, so that, But that crust is really important. I also think that if it's a beaten egg recipe where you moose up your eggs, that that kind of lifts to the top a bit as yeah, well. I, I, you know, beating an egg makes a big, big difference. Giving it as much aeration as possible really does help to give a lighter crust on the top, but you can still get that lovely, intense, gooey bottom. The the problem I found with the sugar crust, and it comes out and it's like, it's got that gloss to it, and I'm so proud of it, that kind of satinate gloss. When I cut it up, it shatters. Is there any way around that? No, but that's a good thing. No, okay. I okay. like that. That's that's the joy of the brownie. I think the fact that it is, it's not about it being precision. If you cut it, you get crumbs and bits and bobs and things like that's the beauty of a brownie. So but, I need to relax on that. Yeah, chill out. Don't worry. I chill know, out with your brownie. <laughs> I know that some people, some professional food stylists and food style, professional food styling is quite an art form in itself. With all, and they arrive with suitcases of equipment. I know that they used to, in my early days in food magazines, they used to cut up meringues with an electric carving knife. Do you remember electric carving knives? Yeah. Those insane things that left the kind of ridge marks on yeah. the ham. Yeah. Um, so I, I've toyed with getting a, an electric carving knife to see if that would do it with my brownies, but you're saying definitely not. Well, I would be quite interested in the result. I, I, do you yeah, use you... electric carving knives in the in your kitchen at all? No, no. We use sharp knives. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it does that kind of shuddering thing. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, are they still know. available? Can you buy them? I don't know. My mum had one and my nan, so I'm not quite sure. I'm sure they must be about. There must be people. It, listen, if yours is broken, don't worry. I'm sure my mum's still got mine. I can, we can always <laughs> borrow it. Now, I think the exciting moment is approaching when we're going to get something to eat. Great. This is the good bit where we get we get all sorts of sound effects. We get the sound of things being unwrapped and we get the sound of chomping um, and general real sound effects these are not put on these aren't done in like in the archers where they kind of fake them up with bits of wood and things this is your actual food here actual so food. we have in front of us i'm going to unveil it now we have two different flavors of brownies 
And these are two different recipes. One's uh, Tom Kerridge's brownies, and one is an Orlando Murrin brownie. And Tom's is uh, flavoured, I think. Tell me what it's flavoured with yours. Uh, so we've got, um, well, we, it, it's um, pecan and hazel. We've got nuts going through ours. So we've got the hazelnut um, and chocolate spread, the kind of thing that is... Uh, the, the the kind of thing that your kids love spreading on toast that that <laughs> that one mixed in um and then we've also got pecans on the top so textural trying to find textural flavor and things that change so it kind of breaks it all up just a little bit they look very much more interesting than than my recipe which is just called best ever brownies which is a very plain brownie and hasn't got any nuts in it at, at all it's just a, a, the the classic thing no uh, but you have got it's, uh, there's a breakup of colour in there, and that looks something that makes it do does look quite exciting. We've it's, got we've got little bits of white chocolate coming in there just just for the for the pleasure of it. Come on, look at that! <laughs> That's not a little bit of white chocolate. There's it, a massive it, chunk of it. It's a shard, it's a, I'd yeah. say, isn't it? It's a, As always, the, these treats have been cooked upstairs by the Good Food Test Kitchen, and um, they they do a beautiful job of every recipe that you put in front of them. Now, I discovered something recently with pecans, which is I used to toast them quite lightly and terrified of uh, that they would take on a bit more colour. And then once I left them there a little bit too long and they took quite a dark colour and I thought they were even better. They tasted even better than when I lightly toasted them. What's all, going on there? All nuts need heavily toasting. <gasps> you they mean we've got to be brave, but we're terrified brave. of burning them. Don't, don't be, be brave. They get, they release this lovely toasty, nutty flavour. The natural, listen, nuts are high in calories and fat, natural fats and whatever because they contain so much of that natural or lovely fat you get great walnut oil or hazelnut oil those are the things that that's all flavor and the more you toast it the more flavor you get don't burn them like but you can take them to a delicious almost like mahogany brown color then they taste fantastic they dr it's it's a bitterness particularly that goes well when you're putting it in a sweet brownie like that. So it's that counterbalance of going, this is sweet, this is chocolatey, and then you get this lovely, bitter, mahogany nut taste. It's just delicious. So do you guys stand and watch them when they're... Are they under a grill or in an no, oven? No, through an oven the with oven. a timer on. No, we get so on with other jobs. So you know just how, you know how long they're going to take. Yeah. But you, it's, it's yeah. between 10 and 15 minutes, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'd have to stand and watch because I don't do... You know, I wouldn't be dealing with that often enough that I would have your, your history of toasting pecan nuts well, to get it right. That, you could have them in the oven and do another job. Like, whilst you, if you're making tea, you could get on with doing something else whilst they're in the oven. Set the know. alarm for 12 minutes do just to exactly. uh, at about 180 yeah 180 is that's good. 160 minimum. fan i guess a yeah. bit more than that even. minimum yeah you could do it a little hotter if you liked and does it make any difference if they're chopped up before do you chop them before or after chop them after chop them, chop, after. Chop them tro roast them whole it's easier to get nice color on them if you chop them before create steam too many little bits that are right cooking. bigger pieces they cook quicker and more even and it's the same for almonds is it toasted almonds yeah because do. you know you buy these naff little packets of supposedly toasted almonds and they're practically the same color as untoasted almonds exactly they're, they're, they haven't really done the job have they or are they, they're too timid are they yeah exactly they're too scared as well they're, they're scared of their timer but actually they're probably they're scared of people going my nuts are burnt they're not burnt they taste amazing yeah we need to have a word with them and get them to do the job a bit more seriously because it's very convenient not to have to toast them particularly if you if you're a, a regular nut burner as, yeah. as I am now I'm going to ask one of our studio team if we can have a knife because these are quite large these brownies what do we need a knife for you use your <laughs> fingers can't we well no to cut them up into smaller oh, should we? Well, well let's have one each go on let's go for it okay. I was going to cut one in half actually okay you cut one in half like that so this is your one yeah I'm not really in competition with you. And when you look on when you look on the website of the recipes, I've got a big apology to make here at this point. This is called wow. Best Ever Brownies. But this recipe was devised for total beginners in the kitchen. So it looks like a very long recipe. It's like three pages long, but it's not actually complicated. It's just very carefully explained for the beginner. Whereas your recipe, to outdo me, fits beautifully on one page and looks as if it's a lot easier. It probably is a lot easier than mine. But mine's very thoroughly explained because it was devised for beginners. Is that all right? It's a good brownie, that. Hmm. It's a good, it's rich, it's gooey. Got the it's sugar crust, haven't we? Got the sugar crust. Mm. It tastes delicious. Uh, now, I'm glad you said that's for beginners. 
because that to me tastes delicious. It's a great brownie. But think of all the extra flavors you put. If you use that as a foundation and yeah. a base, and then put toasted nuts on it, or then put marshmallows. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You did that as a base. I think that's a that's a great brownie. So then. we'll we'll treat that as our kind of classic uh, entry level brownie to to which you yeah, can that adapt. Could, that is, yeah. That no, that's world class brownie that you could just throw an extra few things in that make it suit you more. Tom, I think you're being very kind. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to eat yours, which I must say looks very much jollier than mine because it's got um, fancy nuts well, It's got a lovely top. little crust on the top, hasn't it? And that's, I think, the pecan. Is that sea salt on the top as well? Th there should be a sprinkling of it, yeah. yeah. Do you want that? I'm making you have a half, but you can have a whole so one I, if I, you like. No, no, no. I'm, not, We've got I'm eating half of a half. We've, but, do you know what? It's, You're saying that's your conscience, are you? Yeah, I'm try trying to be a good boy. We will be finishing them up later on with the help of a few <laughs> friends, won't we? I'm going to try this one. Oh, my goodness. Mmm. 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 Yeah, it's no, really I know. squidgy. I know. It's, it is, isn't it? It's danger. That's, is that the chocolate and hazelnut spread that's made it super squidge? Wow. Yes, it is. Um. Mm. I know oh. it's not like a competition. Mm, I'm going to have a bit more. If it's the most squidgiest mm. brownie you're looking for, mm. that that mine mine is the winner. Mm. But that's only if it was the it entered into the most squidgy brownie competition. I think I've got gold. However, if we entered it into the classic brownie competition, <laughs> mine would come last place, <laughs> and you would get gold. <laughs> Now, is that, can, that's the day and age that we live in, in it, where everyone's a winner. <laughs> everyone, that's very <laughs> diplomatic of you. Um, is there any any way that you can convince us that um, a brownie can be part of a healthy Tom Kerridge style diet? No. <laughs> <laughs> there, I mean, abandon pretty, all hope, ye who enter here. Well, you know, if you if you are if you're calorie counting and controlling, then you can go with right. I tell you what. I can have that. I can treat myself to that. My mine coming at four hundred and eighteen calories of brownie, right? And it's not even a massive brownie. <laughs> Yours comes in at two hundred and eighty-eight, so it's good. Um, you know, well over a hundred calories less, and also is the, so. So you win again. You win on calorie count and all. So <laughs> I wasn't I was aiming to. <laughs> so I think I think you win two one, but. It, it, Listen, if you control, if you're looking at what you eat, you put it into part of a balanced diet. Yes, a brownie can be in there. Of course, it can. We can all eat whatever we want as long as within reason. If you're not going to eat eighteen brownies every day, listen, it'll be all right. You just got to watch what you eat with everything else. So it can be part of your healthy diet if everything else you're eating is healthy. How does that sound? Fantastic. And on that happy. And optimistic note, we will finish our brownie chat for today. Thanks so much, Tom. That's I've learned so much. A pleasure. Thank you for listening to today's show. You'll find the recipe and thousands more on bbcgoodfood.com. If you have a minute, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at BBC Good Food.